So we'll get going. It's a great pleasure to welcome our friend uh, Laurie Phelps uh, to the virtual stage for another uh, session in our EdTech seminar series. So people will have seen from the poster that I shared that Laurie is a, a senior research lead at JISC, and we'll hear more about JISC in a while perhaps. And Laurie is also a professor of digital education and leadership at Keele Institute in the, in the UK. And just to add a little bit of uh, biographical uh, color, even though you have plenty of this yourself, Laurie, I can uh, reveal that Laurie is also a Navy veteran and went on later in life to stu study um, environmental science. He has crossed, crossed, excuse me, both polar circles and has, he tells me, received a cold reception in lots of other places as well. So a slightly different format today. It's going to be more of a fireside chat than a presentation as such. Uh, Tom and I will soften Laurie up with a few questions and then we'll take questions from the floor. So get your, get your questions ready. You can either ask questions over the mic, we can give you the mic, or you can just put your questions into the, into the Q&A area. So as we're talking, maybe be thinking about something you might want to, to ask of, uh, of Laurie. So I'll put in the first question, if you don't mind, and you can be thinking about a second one, one Tom, if that's okay. Um, just, in, just in case people don't know Tom, actually, sorry, this is uh, Dr. Tom Farley from uh, MTU Kerry campus. Um, and uh, we know Tom and have worked with Tom for, for many years, and indeed he's very well known in the whole edtech space, both, both nationally and, and internationally. So I'll get us going maybe, Laurie, and ask you maybe to tell us a bit more about the organization that you work for, JISC. You know, so I've, I've summarized it in the poster as being a not-for-profit that uh, provides digital solutions for UK uh universities uh, uk third level um i i would be familiar i'm sure tom would be as well and a lot of other people tuning in with a lot of the reports and the, and the research that you that you put out and very good it is too is there anything else you'd like to add about what JISC does or what JISC um um uh, what what JISC is about or even if i'm pronouncing the name of it correctly you can start there if you wish yeah it's JISC. um it used to be an acronym and it's not anymore. Um, we're, we're, we're what's called an NREN, which is a National Research Education Network. So we started off 30 years ago by putting the network, the infrastructure in, um, digging up roads and actually putting the cables in across the UK for education institutions to connect up with the internet. Um, and then pretty soon after that, people started saying, well, what are we going to hang off this internet? And JISC grew into not just providing the infrastructure, but providing advice and guidance, and also looking at libraries and e-content and providing licensing deals and a whole host of other things. So that's what we do is we work with every university and college of further education in the UK to, to sort of leverage the most that we can out of the internet and digital and technology. Excellent. Um, so a, bit, a little bit like HEA Net, but but then a, a little bit more by the sounds of it. You're probably familiar with uh, yep. HEA Net over here. Okay, so that that that's where you're coming from, Tom. Do you want to lead us out more on the on the specific research that uh, that Laurie's yeah. been doing? I just should remember. Did it stand for Joint Information something something? Just it did. Something. Committee. It did. Something yeah, it, it was a committee. But, yeah. So that's, that's a really important point, actually, Tom. Um, it did stand for a, a joint information systems committee, but the committee was made up of people like Garod and Tom um, from the sector. So we had lots of committees that actually directed the, the direction of JISC. It said, look, this is the way we want you to go. So I think one of the things that I'm most proud of working for JISC is that we, we aren't just for the sector, but we actually came from the sector. And I think that, that's, that that stands us apart from a lot of other NRENs and a lot of other organizations is that, you know, we've been driven by academic practice. Well, I think and talking about practice, and I, I'm just putting up a link here, a particular really good report. I mean, you produce lots of stuff, but I suppose also worked at yourself and, and, and Donna Langfoss, who, who uh, we, we, we've chatted here before, but the work on listening to teachers and I yeah. suppose it was published in 2019. Now, obviously, uh, you know, you know, before before obviously the pandemic here, 
thinking back to some of the things, and I'm just sort of, and I realize I'm kind of throwing it a bit at you here. But one of the things was talking about, you know, the interviewees talking about, uh, you know, frustration and, 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 and stuff there like that uh, was one of the things there. Uh, students were concerned to how to support students' well-being. Um, do you think if you were to, how, how, how well prepared, I mean, the lessons that you, you, you and Donna took away from there, did you kind of go, oh, my God, did we, we've been predicting this or, you know, th- that research, what did it tell you and what did, reflecting back on what's happened in the last year? Do you know, anybody could say that they've written something that predicted this. I've read the stuff that you've written and I've read stuff that other people have written. And, you know, you can see the seeds of what uh, of what people have been saying for a long time. And no, we couldn't have predicted the pandemic. Um, and I certainly don't think the work that Donna and I did was in any way, you know, foretelling the, the sort of problems that we had. Um, and, you know, and I certainly wouldn't want to lay claim to that. But the work that we did, and I should say that the work came about because we started off, first of all, with the technology. I got asked by JISC to say, to go around and try and look at the technology that was emerging. And they said, great, what's coming out? What might the next version of a virtual learning environment look like? And so I started doing a whole load of desk research and I started asking tech companies and I started talking to university heads of e-learning and we got a whole load of different bits of information and, you know, we put that into a report and then we looked at that and we went, this is all well and good and it's all technology driven, but we need to listen to what the teachers are actually doing. And is anything that we've just written about what teachers actually want to do? You know, is this how we work with students? So that's why we went off and we started talking to academics and we said, okay, let's go and listen to what they saying let's go and listen to what they want to do and that's where that report came from that listening to teachers it was going around we didn't have a um a set set of a set of questions that were saying let's talk about technology we just said tell me about how you teach tell me about what bothers you and tell me about what you want to do and we expected people to come back to us and say i want to do this i wish i could do more of that um, I really want to do big lectures. I want to do small lectures. I want to teach online and do VR and AR and things like that. And none of that came out. They said things like, I really worry about my students. I need a space that I can go to where students can talk to me and they can sit with me and they can tell me what their problems are and they can trust me. Um, and they would say things like, I really want to try this new thing. I really want to be able to experiment with my teaching and have a crack at this, but I don't want anybody to come down like a ton of bricks on me if it goes wrong. Um, and, you know, they'd say, I really don't want to use this particular space for what it's designed for. What I really want to do is do something else. So we got all of this information and it was useful for us at JISC in terms of telling us what teachers wanted. Um, it was completely um, not what I was expecting. I think it was a little bit that Donna was expecting. And I know that you've spoken to Donna before um, on this series and, you know, she's, she's an anthropologist and she's used to people's behaviors. I'm an environmental scientist and I've been working in technology for 30 odd years. So, you know, I was, I was looking for the, this is what they want to do with tech and it wasn't there. And so though that kind of information and that kind of, do you know, it was almost visceral. There was one lecturer that cried when he was telling us about his students, you know, and it's so, You know, when you start to interview people and they start telling you about their teaching practices like that, you start to really get a sense of what they care about. And I think that's where that paper came from. I know we've written it in a fairly academic style and in a fairly, you know, it might it might seem a little dry. um, But the 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 information that there has come from a place with academics of a deep caring for their students. And that that was the, the, the driver for doing more of that work. And we've been carrying on doing that. Yeah, and no, I think, in, in fairness, I mean, like, I don't think it's a try you, you say. I mean, you've lots of little vignettes within it, uh, and you give sort of you know a line or two, and you you, you said said you bring it alive. Do you think it will be interesting? Can you see just doing something now about the teachers' voices, looking um, back on, on on what's happened this year? I've done about a hundred hours of interviews with academic staff in the yeah. same way. So we've actually been doing it all the way through the pandemic. We started, actually Donna and I started um, way back when in 
March, April last year, when not everybody was even locked down, we started saying there's something coming. We were very fortunate to be in touch with Peter Bryant in Australia. Um, Donna was here in the February. We were talking to Peter Bryant on a call like this, and Peter said, we're going into lockdown. And we went, what's lockdown? And he said, it's all going to go offline in terms of being face-to-face. -face. Everything's going to go digital. And we just said, really? And he went, yeah. And then the next thing we know, it's 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 here and we'd already put in place the fact that we were going to start doing research this way and it's been a, a little bit traumatic talking to people through the last year um, but we've learned an awful lot um, it's really put people like yourself and Garode and I'm guessing Dara and many other people here under under real pressure yeah, you know and, and, that's and, that's and everywhere you talk, yeah you talk about the emotional I mean like one thing and I've been at a lot of conferences and meetings and stuff as you have do, do, do you see possible issues for the community down the line when when i'm not necessarily say a tsunami of, of mental health issues but do you do you see possible issues coming down the line i've seen them now um you know it's it's not down the line it's it's now there was an academic early on this was um around summertime last year and we interviewed um and I said, so how's it going? And we just started having a conversation, you know, just having a chat to start with. And I asked him how he communicates with um, his peers, his peers in the university, and how does he um, communicate with students? And he said, well, I haven't got any students at the moment, um, and I'm the only person that's doing the research that I'm doing in the university. And I haven't spoken to anybody face-to-face -face or with voices because I live alone for over a month. And he just, I was just like, I said, so he said, this is the first time I've spoken to anybody. You know, I just don't speak to people now. Um, and there was nothing in place. Um, I said, is anybody checking on you? And he's, no, he said, and basically just living alone, doing his research, you know, in, in the best case, he was just minding his own business and getting the research done, waiting for the next term to start so he could work, start talking to students again. Um, but people fall through the cracks. It's nobody's fault. Nobody is responsible. People are responsible, but nobody should be blamed um, because we're all feeling it. Um, but this academic really made me think about the well-being, and it made me think about how we're connected to each other and how we're not connected to each other, even though we think we are. Now, I, I talk on Twitter um, to you guys all the time, but this guy did no social media. So his only connection was by email, and it's the only way that he was connecting with his peers was by email. It's a fairly sterile, uh, fairly sterile world. Um, uh, other pieces, now, and this is maybe a little bit of uh, self self advertisement for for the journal. Uh, people may or may not know it's yours, Journal of Technology Enhanced Learning, of which I'm one of the editors. You actually had a paper again, and I put up a a link: uh, the trust, innovation, and risk: a contextual inquiry into teaching practice and the implications for the youth technology. Um, and then once again, I know I'm throwing stuff at you again. Um, if if those implicate, and I know you were saying you're not you're not you're not sort of claiming you foresaw everything there like that, but some of the implications that you saw in, in, in that that was coming down from from that general project um, again, uh, I suppose once again I know it's drawn on that same sort of basic one, but did that get because that wasn't the gist publication? Did you get a chance to maybe push the push the boundaries a little bit more and sort of saying a bit more that you wanted to say there that you mightn't have said in in, in the report. Yeah, I, I thought one interesting thing there, Laurie, in, in that particular uh, article as well, and maybe it goes to Tom's question, was the, the big emphasis on trust. So trust <sighs> as really being one of the important themes that came out of talking to people. And uh, one of the important things that determines why and how people make decisions around things like the, using technology for their teaching and does it link back to something you said earlier you know about um you know people wanting to try things but afraid somebody was going to jump down their throats or, or come down hard on them if it didn't if it didn't work out that's part of the whole trust uh thing as well i think is it it, it was, but it came out in two different ways. Um, the first, the, the reason, I and mean, the reason that trust stood out to us when we wrote that paper was the first one was it, lecturers talked an awful lot 
about establishing trust with their students. And so they, they placed emphasis on building trust and, and that came through really strongly. And I guess it was, it's, it's not unsurprising, um, but I think a lot of it was recognizing that students in higher education are, are adults and are, um, you know, in the, in the UK, um, sorry, in England, um, they are having to pay an awful lot of money to go to university. And I think lecturers feel the pressure to establish trust, to be able to talk to them, to be able to effectively work with them on their education. And I think that a lot of the things that were coming through, the trust was a precursor to partnership. So that was with the students. Um, but also there was there was stuff in there that was a bit of a surprise. Um, you know, there was particularly one one um, one prof of education um, basically turned around to us and said, "Look, I know that the dean in my institution is anti ed tech, um, and we've got change management issues across the board." And it was just again, it, the other the other elements was the the trust was that lecturers wanted to be trusted to find a good way to teach, to find a way forward, to be given the space. And, you know, when we say give somebody space to try something, we're effectively saying we trust you to go off and try this and make sure that it's good for your students. And if it's not good for your students, we trust you to actually, you know, move back on course and try something else until that's good for your students. So that came through really strongly. Um, but and, and what we found was is, not across the board, but I think we did see a pattern where lecturers sometimes weren't trusted by senior management to do things. Very interesting. Do you, do you think because of what happened during COVID and because everything, you know, we couldn't have this kind of command and control or dictate what everybody would do, people in a sense had to be given the freedom that, that you're talking about to go off and try things and try and deliver their modules and uh, learning objectives in whatever manner they saw fit. I mean, in a way, has, have, we, have we seen a lot of um, people trying out things they, might, they mightn't otherwise have done? And, and, and might that carry forward a little bit, do you think, into whatever post-COVID uh, means to you? I think there's been an acceleration, you know, and that's for good or bad. There's been an acceleration, right, of change. Um, the issue now is whether or not it springs back. But I think that trust has been part of that and possibly an enforced kind of trust. Oh, God, I'm going to have to trust them to do this because there's no way that I can get on top of everything. Yeah. Um, senior managers, you know, we talk about lecturers being put under the cosh, but, uh, you know, the senior managers that we've been talking to, and we've interviewed a lot of senior managers as well, how they're having to respond to, um, government edicts and the changing regulations and things like that they're not only caught up and we know a lot of them are doing their own research so they're not only caught up trying to maintain their academic credibility and their research portfolio and their own teaching in some cases but they're also trying to make sense of, of quite frankly in my country a set of regulations that don't make any sense you know the, the you know and then building that across wales and scotland and um, students crossing borders and all of those sorts of pressures that senior managers in institutions have been under to try and get education delivered. But when you look at it, and I, and I sort of look and, you know, for all of the problems we've had, and I, and I look at our universities in, in, and I'm just saying in, in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in Ireland, education's happened. You know, I'm not hearing mass problems I'm hearing rhetoric around students not feeling value for money because they're not on campus. Um, but when we say to a student, you know, what do you want? And they say, we want to be on campus. We shouldn't just automatically say, so you want to be in a lecture. And I think there's a danger that we might translate what students are saying into what we think we want to hear. So we need to be careful about that. But by and large, you know, I'm seeing education not just delivered, I'm seeing excellence as well. You know, I'm 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 not invested in in sort of you know promoting any particular universities, but I'm seeing real excellence. And you know, one of the things that has been really interesting for me is uh, we have an attainment gap issue in the UK um, for black students, for example. And during lockdown, the black students um, seem to have levelled up in terms of the attainment gap. So the actual 
that, that they've been accessing material and resources in such a way that they are now on, you know, pretty much closing the gap and on a level with their peers. And it's not a case of coming together. It's actually a leveling up. And I think there's, there has been a certain set of students, whether they're introverts, whether or not um, they're the ones that, that sit quietly at the back in class. During lockdown, we're starting to see that, do you know what? The student body is not an homogenous set of faces. They've all got different needs. And some of those needs are really being met by lockdown. Talking about translation and trust, and I hope I'm not throwing you sideways, Think one of the big considerations, or certainly last year, was this how can we replicate or translate exams into the online world? And this whole thing about proctoring and stuff. Any thoughts about, you know, rather than actually maybe see, can we use as an opportunity to assess differently? We've just, there has been a tendency amongst some people to just try and replicate sitting in a big exam hall with a, an invigilator. Um, so I, I don't know what system um, MTU is using. And so, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be careful. I'm no fan of proctoring. I've got real concerns having, you know, I've been to the Ian Lenklater, um lectures. I've been working with people like Autumn Keynes and talking to her about some of the issues. Um, and, you know, the, some of the work that's going on, Chris Gilliard in America is an absolute tour de force when it comes to, you know, examining surveillance issues and privacy issues and, you know, issues for students. And and I've got some serious concerns about the way that some um, technology companies have, have, have looked at the situation and tried to leverage profit from it. Does, does that answer the question? Yes, yeah. No, look, I, didn't <laughs> I mean, no, I, I myself... Uh, would have would have uh, gray, gray reservations, and as I said, oh, yeah, I, I think we all do. I mean, yeah, we've yeah. we've we've done a bit of it, Laurie. I, I can I can get into uh, detail with you about why we did it, uh, but the range of operational and technical issues arising, never mind the ethical stuff, is very off putting. But I will add one more name to the list you were offering there, and that's Audrey Waters, who yes, uh, of, of course sp spoke to us last year and you know, excellent. So I asked her to talk about a theme, what she thought was a big theme in ed tech today. And of course, her theme was surveillance as far as she's concerned. There's a whole range of these different um, ed tech technologies that are kind of quite questionable, I suppose, in, in, in how they're deployed or, or even in terms of, um, you know, the kind of um, the money behind them, the culture behind them. Yeah, Audrey's, and Audrey's great. I mean, I, I read everything Audrey writes. Uh, I'm just waiting for her new book to come out. Um, and it, it's, it's with the publishers, I understand now, and I'm really <laughs> looking forward to it. Um, but she's, she's absolutely great. Um, I, I've been the reason I, I cited um, people like Chris Gilliard is that he's actually in a, a, a community college working on these issues, and he's he's understanding how you know some of these technologies are actually causing difference and causing um, problems with certain groups of students as well, um, and I, it's going to be a problem. I worry about disabled students as as I think Tom knows. I I started off working uh, in the sector with disabled students and some of the issues there and i'm dyslexic as well and so some of the the systems that are in place would really disadvantage me um you know it's it, if this was a written if this was a written interview i'd be in real trouble uh, without some of the software that i have on my, my machine um but you know that's that's the nature of technology we should be looking to ways to level up people and use it for equity and you know we can't have a complete equal system but we need to find ways of actually using technology for good um i guess is the is the is the strap line that i'd use for this you know what does technology for good look like and i don't think that it's about monitoring things and i don't think it's about surveillance and i don't think it's about making students stressed you know some of the interviews i read with students who had been through the proctoring system were just dreadful um you know they felt invaded and I don't think that we should be using technology like that. And I and I see more and more institutions refusing to do proctoring now. But I, I think we need to not think of this as just a university problem. We also need to think that the, uh, is it the PSRBs, um, 
the professional standards and awarding bodies, for example, you know, yes, they have certain requirements and medics and things like that to sort of go through this and they want the proctoring. So we have to find a way of doing it with them. But, you know, in my mind, we, we just need to think of better assessment. Yeah, actually, that that's the one reason we were pushed in the direction of doing proctoring, the insistence of a professional association. So there's very little you can do about that, perhaps uh, in the short term. But some of what you're saying is back to trust again, isn't it? Do we trust our students or not? You know, so if we turn the whole in thing into a big who done it mystery, <laughs> I mean, that's uh, that you know that 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 doesn't articulate with our um, notions of being student centred, if you like, or or as you say, with the potential of ed tech to be such an egalitarian force to break down barriers to learning, be they, you know, geographical or personal or cultural or, or otherwise. Our values in edu in higher education, our values should be about trust, I think. You know, we're trying to we're trying to create graduates that are civic minded and and good for society, right? And so starting off from a point of I don't trust you, so I'm going to watch you like a hawk. Is probably not the best way to start, because then we end up with graduates who think we have, who think that surveillance should be the norm. Yeah. No, no, I'm just reminded before I have a sense Tom is going to come in, but just to encourage people from now on, really, um, please come in on the chat. We'd like to get some other questions and some other kind of energy. So if anything, uh, you know, has piqued your interest or. or you know that you strongly disagree with even please please, uh, please do come in let us know using the q a feature or, or the chat feature there and you don't have to come on the mic either if you'd rather not uh, uh chat chat is fine as well i i should say that we've, we've carried on doing this research we've got let's say we've, we've done over another hundred hours of research we're carrying on doing it we've got um donna's back working with us again doing some more interviews we're doing more student interviews this time so we're actually interviewing students um, and hopefully by the foot, by the, the autumn, we'll have a sense of uh, what they're saying. So, you know, again, we'll be looking for the, we'll be looking at ILTA because we like the open access platform and we like the open publishing platform. Excellent. Um, Dara has a question actually. So here it is. I was very interested in what you mentioned, Laurie, about students succeeding from an educational attainment point of view, but missing out on the student on campus experience and the benefits that accompany that. Do you think there's a solution to the lack of physical community slash space experience or in the in the world of online teaching and learning? So I suppose is there, if I'm understanding it, is there a way to make up for what you, you know, what you might be missing out on by having an on-campus experience uh, in the world of in the world of online or is the ultimate some kind of optimal blend of the two maybe where online does does what it does best and face-to-face -face, uh, takes care of the rest uh, what do you think Laurie? i don't think online is a substitute for getting in a room and and talking to people um, if I'm honest, and you know, given my position, I'm supposed to say, "Oh, yes, of course, we can replicate, and design, and build." The reality is, right now, um, there isn't. You know, we we need that connection. We need to be around people, um, and we have to remember that what we're going through at the moment is a crisis. You know, this is not this is not something that we could have prepared for to the extent to which we had to cope. You know, we're going through a crisis. Where you know, I'm, you know, people like me, I've got asthma, and um, or I get like bad hay fever. But even so, I don't want to be out and putting myself at risk without having the jab. Um, you know, and I know a lot of older people like Tom don't want to put themselves at risk when they go out. So you know, there's a there's a reason for us to sort of isolate and and be away from people. So I worry that you know that we we look for solutions that we don't need solutions to i think we do need to get a really good blend of online i think we really need to look at how we communicate and experience each other online but that might take several years um and i don't want to be the doomsayer here but i can't help wondering looking at the variants that we could be going in and out of lockdown over the next 10 years you know, I think we could probably have three or four more of these incidents as we go forward. Um, we, sh sure, we should at least I, I, we should I, at I, least I, prepare for them. And as an environmental scientist, I suppose you know you'll be thinking about uh, 
climate crisis as well and various other natural catastrophes. Well, where I live in the uh, in the UK, in 50 years, there's a good opportunity for this to be a waterfront property. So, Will that increase its value, Laurie? Is that... Uh... Uh, quite, possi <laughs> quite possibly. <laughs> I, just, I just watched the questions. One here from Niall. So in relation to levelling up, have you been able to see anything in the data of students falling down due to online learning? And what in your experience has been the biggest barrier for students in terms of online learning? So it's, it's a really, it's, that's a really good question. So we have seen the, the levelling up. We've seen that and, it's, and uh, we've documented that. that. The, the falling down bit, there's been an awful lot of universities that have intro, in, introduced um, a no detriment policy. So it's been less visible for the falling down. But in talking to students, when they, when they tell us about online learning, they're describing some really effective learning practices that they've established themselves. They're talking about how they do independent research. Um, uh, I'm trying to articulate it. But, you know, when they tell us about their practices and about how they engage and how they go finding resources um, with the right structures in place, they, they really are, um, you know, finding really good, effective ways to be le learning. And I think that we'd all sort of look at those students as independent learners and go, well, that's exactly what we want in our graduates. The barriers come, and these are the, these are the problems that we have um, that, that they're telling us. Barriers come in terms of inconsistency for students um, between you know, one course and another course. And they talk about, well, it was all over here, and this is where I thought I had to go for it. But then that like, lecturer has got a completely different system and they want us to go over here and do something else. Now, it's not about templating and having benchmarks and minimum standards for what stuff should be. Where they tell us there's barriers, it's where somebody's gone completely off piste with no reference to anything else. So it's about having to, you know, a lot of it for English universities is about checking back with uh, we have centers for teaching and excellence and teaching and learning and things like that and it's like you know there's a set of guidelines that they, those centers put out and you know where we found that they've been followed what we found is that students have generally been really happy the biggest barriers are, are when you know we, we we miss the guidelines that those centers put out because for us you start you start realizing that the centers have actually established this baseline for a reason um, and it's to sort of make sure that the students can have this this same sort of quality. So that that that's been the key one for me um, is making sure there's some level of consistency and and listening to the centre, not the centre in terms of senior management, but listening to the centre for teaching and learning has be, has been the key for the work that I've been doing. Excellent, excellent. It's kind of connected, Laurie. I suppose a question here from Sarah. She says you mentioned uh, students with disability. I'd imagine that some students with disabilities have benefited from the change to education during the, the pandemic, especially asynchronous learning. And they might actually lose out if we go back to the way delivery was before the pandemic. Um, your comments? Yeah, I'm doing some research about this now. So what I found is, is that, yes, there's been a, again, in the same way as um, some students from certain backgrounds have benefited from what's been going on. And I think asynchronous is key. I think asynchronous is fundamental in this, is being able to sort of go and look at this. And it may have been that um, a lot of students, for example, who are working jobs or commuter students in the UK, have benefited from the asynchronous nature of what we've had to go through. So they're able to access those materials. Um, and I think that that's true for the disabled students that have done better. However, um, looking at the data, I am seeing small percentages of the gap widening with some groups of disabled students, and we need to identify why that is. And my feeling is, is that, and, and it's a feeling at the moment, because I've only got very very small amounts of data is that the students who are vision impaired are struggling with um, some of the asynchronous material that's been put out there and again that's about standards and about meeting accessibility requirements and i think in the rush to get everything out there that some of the stuff has been a little bit problematic you know um, lots of slides without much explanation and things like that so those students have possibly not benefited as much as some like me who's dyslexic 
um, and some of the other students. And again, students who are on the uh, um, who suffer with autism, for example, um, excuse the language, but students with autism may be finding that they've got their own personal space and can focus in it without having to go through the stress of a lecture. So it's things like that. Um, so yes, Sarah, there's, it's, it's more, much more work to do for us to unpick what's going on with that. Um, but this is the problem, isn't it? There's, there's been an awful lot of talk about e-learning for so long. And I, and I do worry that everybody thinks that the student body is this homogenous set of students that all look the same and do the same. Um, and this is really unpicking about all the differences. And I can't help thinking that an asynchronous model might benefit more students than a synchronous model. I don't have evidence for that yet either, but it does make me think. Definitely, particularly as you say, if it articulates with the various different um, technical standards that exist in terms of W3C, Section 501, and um, the usual stuff around um, universal design for learning. And of now, course, you, you, you guys have your European regulations as well. That's right. I didn't want to say that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could tell you that you were thinking. Yeah, I was, dying, I was dying to get that one in, and particularly after the old man dig. Mind you, I got me fourth AstraZeneca, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that there. Uh, a, a question and sort of comment here from Margaret here. She was saying she strongly agrees with the missing of social space for student to student experience and lecture to student. Uh, and we'll be interested what online spaces people find useful for these types of, of a more humane experiences she says like you believe there are many of us going to be in this space for a long time so i suppose she's talking about what sort of online space might be useful for that humane but also wondering about the the short contact time to reduce online are we going to have less time then for the social pastoral interaction then and how might academics support that loss of confidence then in their social skills so there's, there's a, a guy there. there's a guy called ken bauer favel um, or Ken Bauer, he's a Canadian teaching in Mexico. Um, he's doing this thing when he teaches, you know, at the end of a lecture and, you know, you're about to leave and there's 20 students all gathering around and you've got your front row of six students and then you've got the back, you know, the, the middle row of another six students and then there's a few other people listening to what the questions were that those front, those front, you know, the six at the front were asking. That's a kind of social engagement at the end of lectures that we're all, lectures that we're all familiar with, right? Um, so Ken started scheduling lectures to start um, like 10 minutes earlier and scheduling an extra 15 minutes for that little gang of students to hang around and ask those questions at the end. And that turned into a social space for his students that was rep trying to replicate that, you know, hanging around as a group at the end of lectures. But it, it's, it's a hard thing to do, isn't it? I, yeah. and, and students are finding ways, you know, WhatsApp is the thing that I hear most from students. Um, but who's not in the WhatsApp group? You know, which are the students that aren't being included? Um, so it, it's a difficult one. And then I see lecturers forming Slack groups and Facebook groups and things like that. But it's always a case of, you know, and it's always a case in face-to-face -face conversations as well. But, I, you know, sometimes you can see who's being left out of face-to-face -face conversations. You know, we all see the guy sitting in the corner of the pub, you know, on his own or her own, um, and we realise we're not including them in the conversation. And you know, many of us will try and bring people into conversations. How do we do that online? Don't have an answer. I really don't. I, I see, you know, making different spaces available as being part of it, but we need to upskill students. Um, but my main concern at the moment is I am worried about students, but I also worry about staff an awful lot. I worry about staff that are on their own, staff that are feeling lonely um, as well. So I worry about that as well. It's not just pastoral care for staff. Sorry, pastoral care for students, which is always on every senior management agenda. What about the pastoral care for staff? And that that's a big thing, I think, that we, we've got to look at. Excellent, Larry, excellent. Kind of related, I suppose, or, or you could certainly um, draw a connection between what you, you were saying on this next question. A question from Daniel Cahill from uh, MTU Cork Campus. Hi, Daniel. Uh, if you could pick an approach that was a blend of the traditional, meaning face-to-face, -face, I presume, and the new, what might it look like? Excellent chat, by the way. D Daniel always is the right thing. Uh, Thank so you, Daniel. I, I suppose we're looking ahead to September now in MTU, Laurie, and we are having chats about uh, what it will mean, you know, to get back on campus uh, and maybe have to cope with 
all kinds of you know mixed modalities, hybrid, high flex teaching and learning. Uh, what should we look out for, I suppose, in, in having that that kind of optimal blend? I mean, you've touched on some stuff there around communication and community and pastoral care. I worry a little bit about cognitive load on academic staff teaching with some modalities. Um, we hear an awful lot about high flex at the moment where you know it's in person face to face and it's also people beaming in from wherever they are and i i see the benefits of that i see the you know an awful lot of um things that could be really useful but i also can't help wondering that unless we've got um a whole host of people that are technically proficient um and we've got the bandwidth and we've got um the the, the people like Dara, who's kindly helping us and helping me with Zoom today, um, if we haven't got that those teams in place, I'm not sure that HyFlex is an answer. And I worry that trying to get lecturers to do that, as well as think about the content. We have to remember that academics are employed because they've got this fantastic content and they are great teachers. But this modality of doing the HyFlex is, is a big cognitive load. Um, I think in the future, we might have people that sort of feel better about doing that. Um, but I don't think it's there yet. So my, my, my sort of thing is, if I'm really honest, I would be recording content. I think I'd be recording content and I'd be sharing that with my students. Um, and then when everybody's read it, I'd be deleting it. Um, because I also think that content needs to be fresh and feel fresh. Um, but that's just me. I'm not a huge fan of of archiving a lecture that went wrong, um, you know, and, and they all go wrong sometimes, right? So, you know, why, you know, that's part of the thing with the trust thing. You know, academics need to have trust that they, their mistakes won't be held against them forever. So we need to sort of think about that. Um, but yeah, it, that recording. The, the other thing that I think good might look like is, are all of your lecturers an hour long? No, they can be longer, but I suppose that that's your standard unit, <laughs> like. Why is that? Why is that the standard unit? Yeah. Well, in part, I suppose it goes back to the way our contracts are framed. So in our sector, it's all about number of contact hours per week, mm. um, you know, expressed as, well, what, what would it be typically, Tom? 18 hours? 18 hours, yeah. For, for an yeah. assistant lecturer. Except so that, that's lecture. certainly part of it. I suppose in reality, it might be closer to 50 minutes because, you know, there's a certain amount of time lost starting a class and finishing up a class. I mean, what are the chances and how lucky is it that all the content just happens to fit into that hour? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It's absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> so, so one of the... So one of the things that I've um, picked up from students um, interviewing them is that they've been saying things like, I had one student who turned around and said, oh, I really like the fact that the, uh, the, the recorded lectures that this person's been doing are only 20 minutes. Um, so I can just listen to it on my phone and then it's only 20 minutes and then I can go off and, you know, ask questions or read the material. Um, and they were asking me, why is a lecture an hour long? And I couldn't answer them apart from the contact hours thing. And also um, university timetabling systems that allocate rooms seem to do them by the block booking of one or two or three hours. Um, and of course, that's not the way content works. And it's not way, the way conversations work, you know. And so I wonder whether or not we need to sort of think about how we break the system to break the content up, to make the, the system a little bit more flexible. Yeah, that's excellent yeah i think frank rennie who was talking to the group last week was saying uh, was saying something kind of similar but maybe the answer is it's a it's a mixture of face-to-face -face, synchronous and and asynchronous yeah. and that 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 gives you that ability doesn't it to have that that that, that kind of flexibility and not be so obsessed about uh, I, I will say that every i should also say every student i've spoken to uh when listening to recorded lectures has told me that, that they listen to them uh, uh, faster than the speed at which they're, they're recorded <laughs> every single I've, I've asked this question now it's just beginning to get interesting and it varies between 1.5 and two times faster 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, mind yeah, mind you, I suppose um, it was some people. Um, I I was told I was uh, lecturing to international students, and I was told by the students that I spoke differently from the rest of my colleagues in Kerry. So um, <laughs> they probably would have slowed mine down. And talk about students. Good question here from Lauren. I wonder how students and lecturers not having that personal trusting relationship that you mentioned earlier was so important to them and ha has an effect on, on both parties since the end of the pandemic. For example, a student not been able to talk to a lecturer about struggles or issues in, in a face-to-face -face environment. Has your research showed any mention of this from the lecturers? It's actually coming through more from lecturers um, about what's in those faces. I mean, I guess there's an argument about the camera on, camera off thing as well. Um, there's something about seeing um the, the people in front of you that lecturers seem to find necessary for some reason um so lecturers have been more upset about that than students have students are quite happy to sit and listen um there's a listening there's a listening culture i found with some of the students i've spoken to um they like to listen to things not necessarily having to watch them um i don't know what it means about trust and i don't know what it means about developing a relationship um, the times when cameras are on seems to be when it's a small group and it's a tutorial. And then I hear students saying, I don't mind having the camera on. There's an objection in large lectures. There doesn't seem to be an objection when you're, there's six people in a room. Um, I think we need to unpick that a bit more and see what that means for social and socialization. But yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, I haven't drawn any conclusions about it yet. You think we need to get away from presentism, you know, that, that, that you know that, that that we're obsessed about oh my students weren't there and you because you made a really good point there about when we talk about the on campus are we talking about the class or the other experiences i mean i'm thinking like there's a place in ucd for example theater l i think it holds four or five hundred people i mean that that's that's a gig it's not a, a, a class and any well, once you go over 80 90 100 uh, a lot of universities so as you said it's not that aspect that i'm missing it's, it's maybe all the other the chats in the corridor, can I have a word with you, all of that stuff? Or at the end of the lecture, there's a, yeah. you know, there's a percentage of students that will hang around. I, I spoke this morning um, to, I've been working with uh, universities in Nigeria. Um, and again, I've been interviewing them about digital education policy and what they're doing. And again, they've got COVID and they can't populate the, um, the, the campuses. Um, and a, an academic this morning, sorry, a director of academic affairs this morning was telling me that we've got, 600 seater uh, lecture theatres that aren't being used um, um he said it, it's, it's very strange but even when they are being used um they might be 600 seaters but they've got a thousand students in there um such is the demand for higher education in in, in nigeria at the moment um you know it, it's there's just not the capacity to deliver it and so there must be a a social problem in terms of that as well because you can't interact with that many people in 60 minutes right so i don't know what the answer is and i don't know where the socialization is for the lecturer is it that is it that walking into the space earlier and getting to the feel of the space and the energy of the students and then at the end of the lecturer at the end of the lecture stopping and and listening and just listening to voices even if you're not actually talking to them so there needs something about that i'm not sure um I'm not, not even sure that I'm answering the question there. I think that the social bit is much more complex than, than, than we were able to articulate yet. Isn't there a sense as well that people assume just because you're in a face-to-face -face environment that it's immediately more social? As a friend of mine in University of Edinburgh, Amish McLeod used to say, once you're behind the fourth row, it's all distance education, really, you know. And we have that that uh, concept, haven't we, from Michael Moore, transactional distance. It's not about how far you are, but how close you feel, as it were, you know. So um, yeah. th there is there is that way of looking at things. Um, one from one from Paul here. He says, in response to the threat of increased cognitive load on lectures in the high flex format, you know, they have so much to do potentially in addressing at least two different groups. Do you think you may see an increase in assistant lecturer roles, technicians or moderators 
who will be responsible for the online technical side. So we we were talking about this earlier, actually. We had a meeting with a, a head of department, and uh, I was referencing the fact that we used to have an answer to this. We used to call it the remote classroom model back in the days of video conferencing. And it was always assumed you would need somebody in the room to field questions and press the on button and stuff like that. But now I'm hearing people thinking, um, Maybe they can dispense with with such a role. To, to me, it seems quite essential that you, you'd have at least somebody in the in the room with the students to kind of get it all going and facilitate things and uh, draw the curtains and what have you. What, what do you think? I I think um, I think it comes down to design. I think that um, I see in America. And, and I apologize that I have not studied Ireland anywhere near as much as I should have, considering you're my closest neighbor. Um, but in America and Canada, I see a culture of learning design and I see, you know, real support for how people teach being embedded into the building of courses and how that will look. Um, you know, there's some great people I've worked with in America um, Sunday Richard, Daniel Linz, and people like that, who are instructional designers, who design how the learning will happen. Um, and that comes down to uh, the, both the pedagogy and the technology. They integrate it really effectively. Um, I think in the UK, we've got some fantastic learning technologists. We don't tend to have instructional designers, although Nick Whitten at Durham has now employed instructional designers to help redesign courses. And I worry that learning technologists should fulfill this role of supporting the learning in this way, but I don't see very much evidence of it. Um, I don't see actual, you know, on-hand support. I see lots of guidance coming out. I see lots of, um, you know, this is what you should be doing, or this is a new piece of kit that you might want to look at. But I, I want to see more hands-on support for academics. One of the things that came out of the research that we did is that we saw people asking, for example, learning technology units in, the, in England. It was, this was just English universities. We saw them during the pandemic saying, this is the problem I've got. This is what I need to do next. And they were basically sent guidelines. And one lecturer said to us, I've, I was teaching at 12 o'clock. I had a real problem about what or how I was going to run this big lecture online. So I got in touch with them. I sent them an email and they sent me back 15 YouTube links on how I could do large lectures. And I think that we need to get past that. So there's an increased cognitive load on lecturers for high flex and just generally online because it's new. It is new. But there's also a culture shift we need to have in the way that we support lecturers as well. And and that might mean more investment in that instructional design area. And, you know, we can't, we can't make more time. So we need to think about how we use it effectively. And we need to think about the only way that we can make more time is by actually giving somebody more hours or giving people more hours or recruiting more people. Um, I'm not sure if that's an answer that Gerard and Tom wanted. <laughs> No, no, all of the above would be fine with all me, above, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Laurie, yeah, thanks. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that one up on Twitter. Folks, I, I'm I'm aware of the time here, and, and I'd like to just get in a final word just of thanks, really, and, and maybe Tom will, will have something to say as well. So, look, thanks so much for that, Laurie. It was a really wide-ranging uh, discussion. Everything was, uh, from my perspective, so well answered and so well 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 dealt with and, you know, answers really coming from a place of such engagement, I suppose, and, and, and empathy as well for all that's going on for, for uh, teaching staff and students alike at this time. So uh, really great questions there as well, I think, as, as you'll agree, which really uh, spoke to the kind of um, engagement we, we got from um, participants today. Um, um, and look, I, I think it's a format we might choose again. For, so I should have said, actually, it was Laurie suggested this particular format. And uh, I think I'm, I'm a convert to it now as well. Tom, I, I'm, did, I'm conscious that people are fed up with slides and people talking at them during the pandemic. We just need a fireside. If it's going to be a fireside chat, you need to have a sort of virtual fire. <laughs> but no, I, I, I think you're right. And I, I think, look, just, just a reminds itself, we can get very, very bogged down with 
the technology above all else it's humans and human relationships the technology then helps that but that's about it you know and so i think you've really captured and you've always that's that's the epitome of who who you are already so well done you, you know there is no digital without people 